This is a flotilla Friday for 2021, September 10th. I, I, I don't really like having the recordings, but I mean, I like having the recordings, I guess, but I don't like recording and feeling like there's somebody kind of hovering, you know, these future watchers uh, hovering over our shoulders. But on the other hand, um, uh, Wendy Elford is a big fan of, of uh, Watching having over. the source material <laughs> looking, and then looking over people. And, well, yeah. <laughs> she, that's her, that's her, uh, a big part of her job is, uh, you know, text analysis. And she's like, well, I can't have text if I don't have transcripts. I can't have, and, and she, when she talks about transcripts, she actually means human corrected, 100% correct transcripts. Mm -hmm. And I can't have transcripts if I don't have recordings. And so, you know. Well, here's a, my wife's an anthropologist and ethnographer and stuff. And so, in the in the BC days when we used to go out to restaurants for eating, occasionally she would get distracted because you know her anthropologist learned like she'd be listening to the table. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it's what we do. <laughs> yeah, reminds me of when my wife and I lived in Southern California, and uh, sometimes we'd end up in in Hollywood or or right around Hollywood, having you know dinner out at a pizza place or something like that and all the tables around you were talking about scripts and, and script workshops and you know deals and all that kind of stuff it was weird yeah yeah or, or being in silicon valley and all the tables around you are talking about uh, which round they're trying to raise and you know whether the good vcs and... except for the small little python glen where they're still talking about scripts but they're different <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just mooning on. I'm having a very good week because I actually got some code to run and I kind of learned a lot and I actually like the way the code looks. So, yeah, Bill's coming off a little bit of a high actually being successful in running code, <laughs> which is a big deal. Um, I wonder. Uh, Wendy or Michael, if you folks want to talk a little bit about um, the Clambake project and how it's going. Please. I can take a stab at it. Um, yeah, so since Michael, Vincent, and I were able to get together last week, we were basically brainstormed, besides aligning our visions and direction, and things like that, we were brainstorming. So how can we bring our visions together? And so that's clam bake. How do we bring it? How do we bring our visions together? So Trove right now, this is gonna be my summary, is kind of a warehouse of organizations, projects, people, right? And in an attempt to help connect all of those things and, and reduce friction for people to find what they need and projects to find the people. Factor is a um, storehouse, you might say, of links and topics, websites, everything you can find on the web organized how you want it to be organized. So it's easy to find it again later with the ability to talk about it and discuss it and all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then my contribution is a vision of how we can visualize things better so that we can navigate to those pieces of information we're looking for faster, easier, and again, reducing friction. So I tend to be all about reducing friction to getting to what we need. My view is also a little more on the personal side, like the individual, seeing a need to improve our individual use of technology so that we can enable individual um, evolution, I guess, <laughs> evolution towards better thinking, more creativity, more innovation, so that we can then contribute, collaborate, like that the individual comes first in my mind, and then it's, then you come to the point of collaboration with others, and then hopefully we come to the point of collaboration, to the point of providing something for society. So I'm just coming at it from the individual side. So creating a UX, UI experience that enables individuals to get to what they need, solutions they need, and then similarly scaling up to oh, same thing for organizations, same things for groups, same things. Okay, so how do we bring all this stuff together? That's clam, that's clam cake, sorry. 
<laughs> and that's, so we're fumbling our way so far. It's just a conversation, but any input is totally welcome. I hope I did that justice. You did great. Um, how's, I, I wonder about some relationships. How's that related to maps and mapping and, and collective intelligence and collective knowledge? Yeah, so for me, those are two different questions. For me, maps and mapping is the part of my thinking that says, how can we use technology to visualize our thinking, not necessarily data? How can we use technology to help us say, I'm thinking this, and that leads to 10 more things. And ooh, that's interesting. And ooh, that's interesting. Instead of sending me down a rabbit hole pre-designed by someone else. Yes, visual thinking. Thank you, Bill. Um, instead of sending me down a rabbit hole designed by somebody else to keep me engaged and sell me something, what's the direction that I want to go in? So it's, you know, it's the brain, it's um, as we think, it's, I think some of this stuff is really a wisdom tree I've been playing around with. Um, I think a lot of um, napkin is trying to do that. I think there's a lot of factors basically trying to do that in, in its own way. Um, but following and enabling better thinking for the individual, again, as being my focus. So for me, I have a, a wisdom tree came the closest so far to, vi to the visual version of what I want, not necessarily take technical capabilities, but visual version of what I'm thinking of. Um, and yeah, just, just my background in research and creativity and, um, and connection in human connection. Uh, has been a big piece of what's informed how this, how the technical visual piece could work. Um, knowledge networks, to me, it's just a natural extension, right, of I need to know I'm researching this now and I want to both store the knowledge that I know and I want to expand on it where I can and then I want to collaborate with other people on the parts I don't know yet and then eventually hopefully create something that benefits everybody. And so to me, that's the the scaling scaffolding knowledge network piece with a personal version and a public version and maybe some hybrid versions for groups that want to work privately together and i hope i hope i did that justice and it made sense yeah doing great so um wendy I'm, i put a, i put a link in there is that the, that the app you're looking at let's see uh, I, I think there's a bit of um discussion about yeah. it in in uh, yeah. the, the clam bake channel too. I think oh, I gotta cool. go. I guess I gotta go. Yeah. Join yes, that that's baby. the one. Okay, all right, yeah, thanks. So that's the one, yep. And it's limited. I mean, I met the, um, I met the uh, one of the founders and um, there's just two guys, they just did it for fun. They're in the middle of working on other stuff. So, you know, I'm, I'm not sure how much development it's gonna get anytime soon. I was just super excited to see the visual version of it. Yeah. So, yeah, if I could, if I could combine his visual, the visual he's created in Wisdom Tree, and put it on like Jer the brain, <laughs> I would, it, I would be I, happy. <laughs> I was wondering about that visual because it. Um, I wonder if you've played around with Obsidian and. Um, their graph visualizer and there's actually two there's a there's the, the regular one and then there's a fancier one i have not yet and you're the third person to rec to recommend that to me this week <laughs> so obviously that's my next if, if you want to get together sometime and and play with obsidian I'd, I'd be happy to do that yeah that'd be great um i also noticed that the brain has a new version version 12 I don't know how old that is or how familiar other people are with it, but I was just posting in the clam bake channel the, that the enhancements they recently made to the brain in version 12 really improved the UI a lot. And I'm loving all the stuff that I'm seeing because it just, again, brings it closer, even closer to what I'm visualizing in my mind and the features that I've, I've uh, outlined for the development that I was planning on doing, but now, now I'm kind of collaborating instead. Um, so I'm curious to know if, other, if anybody else has been using the brain or, you know, what other, there's, and there's I know a, I can um, Jerry and ask him a bunch of questions, but. Uh, we should, we should uh, have you over uh, to visit um, the Free Jerry's Brain Call um, where Jerry, mm -hmm. it, it's people who are interested in um, data, 
uh, graph graph knowledge bases, I guess. Um, but we talk a fair bit about the brain, and um, there's Jerry often comes, and then Mark Trexler, who also has a very large brain that he has uh, semi commercialized. Um, uh, they, you know, they they know they know a lot about the brain. They're they're power users, super power users. And, and I Mark's remember the one who did the climate version one. Yeah. Or the, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was looking at that too. Yeah, um, I remember they were talking about uh, version twelve coming out a couple months ago, and they were, you know, they, there's some nice things in it. Oh, so it is new. Okay. Yeah, um, and you you can get stuff. Well, actually, um, you can back up your brain um, to a, a reasonable data file, but then the data file they they don't really support. Or they haven't documented the you know export formats or anything. Or they, there's an API, but it's kind of private. It's not supposed to be public. Um, uh, we have code though that does parse both uh, the API and the and the uh, exports, the the backups. So mm -hmm. it's possible to get data out of it, um, but it's not friendly. Yeah, I know Vincent. That was my primary question. You anticipated it because I know Vincent uh, did that once. He yeah. did a portion of it yeah yeah okay Bill? um do, is the brain generally collaborative this is just one more question I don't no mean to it's not multiplayer it. either yeah, which is yeah. i i think that's, that's a bummer that's the most sad making thing that jerry has right now that you know he's he's very um the brain is a really good tool for him but he really wants to play with other people and so yeah that would be that's the biggest barrier for me mm -hmm. That in the data format isn't very open. Yeah. Bill? I'm, I have questions, but I, you know, who wants to hear them? Um, when you talked about, right, when you, you reacted when I typed visual thinking, but I was typing too fast. What you were really talking was about visualizing thinking. And I'd like to hear more sometime or look at more or have maybe a time to actually talk about what you're getting at there. Because partially when I used to teach, I used to, well, it was graduate students, but I used to, I used to assert that they all knew the best ways that they learned things or had some idea what they were. And so this thing about visualizing thinking, I, I, I would like to know what we're talking about, because it's an actual activity. Then I think, you know, having some way of wandering through the warehouse and the storehouse and making sense out of the two of them, you call Trove a warehouse and factor a storehouse. And I'm like, uh, okay, but when we're thinking, what are, what are we doing? You know, it could be about I'm focused on a task, but sometimes I'm just looking at the clouds and, you know, ruminating. Do you want to pick that up, Wendy? Yeah, sure. Um, it's a great question. I, I think it, it's interesting for me to have technical conversations around it. So let me just... <laughs> kind of back up for a second and say, I understand the nature of most of the questions I've, I've, been, I've been asked from people who work with data are coming from a perspective where visualizing, using technology to visualize something usually means visualizing existing data. For me, because I came at this project from a direction of positive psychology and that sphere, I came at it from wanting to start from the place of the visual and have the database be in the background because I know the database needs to be there, right? <laughs> Rather than it being a, a, the visual being a way to better understand data that's already there. I'm trying to use a visual interface to help me create what I'm, to help me see what I'm thinking, right? So, yeah. So if I'm, it really, the storing of the knowledge is really just baseline, right? Because I haven't had this tool already. If I'd had this tool already, I would have been putting things into this 
user interface the whole time and the storage would be there as a default. But because we, I haven't had it up to this point, then I need something from which I can maybe upload some, some other documents or um, Excel files, CSV files, other things, because I've been forced to store information that way so far. But really, I want to see it in this visual interconnected way because I have so many, so much going on and have gone down so many different avenues of thought and started to realize how, you know, I, I researched into this area of, of positive psychology and then I researched over here into climate change and then I researched over here into helping my community through COVID and some of those pieces connected to each other, but it was impossible to connect them. It would have been lovely if in the moment I could have gone zoop, like, and just connected those two things. For me, I'm a visual person. That's not everybody. I get that. But because, yeah, um, you just wrote positive psychology. And yeah, it's, I, that's my, that's my, uh, that's, that's basically taking the best of how we think and what we do and, 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 doing it more often, making it more common and doing it more often. So I'm trying to use technology to enable that, right? So in my case, it's we're creating these connections then that are really the essence of creative thinking. And we are often at our best when we can be creative and that's where solutions start to come from. So I think there's a bunch of low hanging fruit, low hanging fruit being storing the knowledge, low hanging fruit being enabling people to get to solutions that have existed for a really long time, but maybe they're not aware of it or they don't know about it. And then it's, then it's enabling people to be more creative, more innovative. Again, it's a visual version of that. I'm not saying that's the only way to do this, but I'm saying it's a big piece that's missing right now that technology could fill. And for, for those of us who would find a benefit in a tool like this, I think we would usually benefit. When I talked to Vincent about it, I, we, we've come to a, and Michael last week too, it was, there need to be different views, right? Sometimes you need to see things in list form. Sometimes you wanna see a map view. Sometimes you wanna look at the database itself. And I think those that would be a valuable interface is to have almost like toggles at the top where you could switch between views or different views being presented at the same time. And again, Matt, you know, the brain just kind of went there in the sense that you have the you have a, the, the, the brain view on one side and you have the page view on the other. So I think, again, some stuff like that's coming, but circling back around, my approach to it is from the visual view and not so much from the data view. Um, if, if I may, I kind of wanted to pick up and, and do, do kind of a parallel um, rant or chat or whatever. Um, I've been, for, the, for a week or two, and maybe a little bit longer, I've been talking about uh, organizing information, um, especially as it relates to wikis. Um, and um, and I have, I've been making a couple of assertions and part of it, I, I, I have a fairly strong position which is, I, I strengthen a little bit just to, to be able to articulate it. I don't think it's the only way to think or the only way that, I don't know if it's true, but I like to take a strong position and, you know, and talk about that. So my strong position is that um, uh, one, one, one thing is that the folks here, people like us are all specialists and we're able to use uh, specialized tools. Uh, like databases or like lists or like visualizations. Um, uh, and most people uh, aren't specialists. They're kind of human generalists and they get through life without using a lot of the power tools that we kind of take for granted, like, like wikis or like databases or like uh, lists of things or streams of things. Um, I think that specialization even goes out to reading and writing. To me, reading and writing is a specialization. Um, we all take it so much for granted that it seems like, well, of course, everyone reads and writes. But if you think about it, in your life, the people that you talk to, how many of them have written you know, 10 pages. How, I haven't written 10 pages recently, right? How many have written, uh, how many have read 100 pages, you know, in the past, you know, week or month or whatever, right? Um, reading and writing is kind of a specialization, and we, we forget that, I think. So in the same way, I think that information organization, um, uh, you have a, a, 
a piece of paper that goes in a file folder that goes in a set of another file folders that goes in a drawer that goes in a particular cabinet or um, probably all of us are old enough to have used physical libraries um, I, I'm going to go look in the either the old physical card catalogs or I'm going to look in the computer card catalog I'm going to find a book about um, elephants um, and then it's going to give me a uh, coded address for a physical location of a, a floor and an aisle and a shelf and a, a section of that shelf where I can go and grab elephants and I can grab other books close to elephants. Um, all of that. So I think probably each of us grew up in an environment where that was kind of just obvious. That was kind of just something that, that everybody did. So when I see people pick up a wiki, um, I see them kind of recapitulating that thinking, right? Um, of course, of course, everybody reads and writes. Um, of course, everybody organizes things by categories or by hierarchy. Um, and that's, and I, I come up on, you know, it's, it's fairly common. People are going, okay, well, I'm organizing information and here's my hierarchy, right? We don't start the conversation about what or what information is, what knowledge is, how we communicate. We just go straight to this hierarchy, right? Here's my hierarchy. I'm comparing it to somebody else's hierarchy. Mine is better than theirs, or theirs is better than mine, and or I, I want to figure out how to map hierarchies. And I'm like, so the the pitch in Massive Wikiland is like, yeah, hierarchies and even categories and stuff like that aren't as interesting as connections, links between um, uh, information um uh and context um so when i when i talk to people about you know uh they the question is how am i going to organize my information in my wiki i'm like well don't worry too much about organizing it worrying worry about capturing it and improving the way it has been captured um moving up from kind of a stream of consciousness set of notes or, or thoughts you know, improve that slowly over time. And it could be like over weeks or months or years in a wiki, you know, where you start to cluster the information, you start to connect it to other things. Um, and then look for ways that you connect information. This stream of consciousness, oh, this reminds me of other streams of consciousness that I've had in the past in my wiki. Let me make it, draw a link between them, right? Um, uh, The, the, and then a way that wikis work, especially when you get a, a number of people doing a wiki together, which is something that we don't see anymore, but we used to do it all the time 15 years ago. Um, uh, there's an interesting thing that happens that people start thinking alike. They, they think in a group brain way. So I, I used to see this all the time. Um, somebody would start to organize something a certain way, and then somebody else would pick up that organization and improve it a little bit or make it worse, maybe a little bit. They'd have some conversations around the edges in a chat system or in real life, and they'd say, oh, I saw that you started putting headers this way, or I saw that we started making links, or I saw that we started having this convention of uh, naming pages a certain way here's my idea about that or i like that and here's the thing that i'm going to do another thing that's similar to that or different than that and as we started working together in wikis we had this collective way of managing information and organizing information and linking information and knowing kind of having body language around um, you know, you could you could end up looking at somebody's page and and kind of know what they were thinking about that page. Oh, they kind of left it in a draft state, and I know that I can improve it. Or, you know, this is a this is a page where they they obviously have a strong opinion about it. This is a rant, and I'm not going to touch their rant except maybe to fix some typos. What I'll do is I'll make a link to it, um, and I'll have a separate rant on a separate page. That kind of body language of you know what this information space means and what we're doing with it and things like that is something that kind of improves and uh, evolves over time. And one of the things I, I I notice about humans is that when we're doing culture together, um, it brings people closer together. It builds trust. It builds relationships that we can rely on and then build upon those relationships to do a better job of keeping information, things like that. Um, one of the, some, some people will look at kind of the chatter or the chit chat or the, the slow process of organizing information kind of organically rather than 
you know, having a library sciences person come in and say, okay, you've screwed up your information, here's the way to do it. That's not really what I, I want out of my wikis, the wikis I participate in, right? Except, you know, sometimes you need that. There are, there are cases when you need that. But in the main, what you want is to have this culture forming that understands how the information is put together, wants it to be better, and works on that together and builds human relationships about how we're doing that. And people are just slow that way. And it's a good thing. It's a really good thing when we go slow and we honor each other's trust and we honor relationships to one another. And when we make jokes about things or we tell people that we're upset about things, I can't believe you stomped on my page. Why did you do that? You know, and you can, it's okay sometimes to be mad at somebody and you work things out, right? Um, all of this stuff, I'm kind of describing humans as they have been for thousands of years, right? Tens of thousands of years. If you think about humans and the way they communicate and the way that they do knowledge, it's not written down, it's not in file folders, it's not in a library. The way you human, the way you culture is by having emotional connections with one another, having trust bonds, social trust bonds with one another, and the way that you communicate information is in what I call stories. And when I say story, I mean probably something pretty small. Um, even as small as a single sentence is to me a story, right? Subject, verb, object. Um, uh, uh, last time grandma got too close to the bear cave, uh, she got eaten, you know, or, um, or uh, auntie was out collecting berries and then she found this new kind of berry which is awesome um, or she found this new kind of berry she ate some and she got sick um, those are the kinds of things that's i think so my I, another strong assertion i have is that people knowledge if i can use knowledge as a verb with stories and so all of the technical specialization tools that we have um, are, are largely, not entirely, but largely ways of, of storing and um, maybe serializing a story into a form that you can pull out later. So text, when you write down a, a, a piece of text, hopefully what you're doing is essentially your brain is telling a story of how something happened to you and then you you actually tell a story about the story that happened to you you can't re really relate the thing that happened to you but you relate a story about it what it meant to you and we have this trick where we we serialize language spoken language into text and then later i can or somebody else can deserialize that back into speech and language and stories and it's not the text that is the communicator it's actually the story that i tried to serialize into text and the story that somebody deserialized out of the text so the story there is the interesting part um, so then something like a map a visualization is kind of the same thing where you take um uh you take a bunch of stories and you can put them in a visual space and you can and and but then the way that you use a map is me later looking at my map or somebody else or me showing somebody else my map it's like a is connected to b this way b is connected to c and d these ways and you you tell a story around the map and that's the the value of the map is it's a, a way to remind yourself of the stories that you can tell in that space the um and when you make a map and give it to somebody else if you did a good job, what happens is that they can brainstorm over the map that you've created and tell stories. They can't look at a map and get all the visual relation. They don't get the relationships of all of that stuff in a flash. What happens is they look at a map and they go, OK, if I need to get from the Empire State Building uh, to, uh, to the, the Met, what I have to do is find this station and use this line and then go to this station and make a transfer and then go to another station and get out, right? You tell yourself a story of how to navigate the map. And that story, again, is the important part. 
The map is just a way of giving you hints about what the stories are, right? And where the stories are. It helps you remember how many stories that you can get. It helps you synthesize new stories. You know, if somebody made a map of all the subway stations in New York, maybe that's not super useful to them or to you, but when you can turn it into something like, I need to get from the Empire State Building to the Met, then you've synthesized this story out of it that they didn't write down. They wrote down all the possible stories with the, the subway stations. But the story, again, is the, the interesting and important part. So then one of the things that I observe with these visualizations, net, uh, graph visualizations of, of knowledge bases always look like junk to me um, if they're automatically done. And it's, I think what happens is that when you just have the machine say, okay, here's all the connections, um, you didn't capture the ability to do, you didn't capture a story. There wasn't a human that said, you know, this is A is connected to B and B is connected to C and it's important because you just had a, a database query that said, okay, splat all the possible connections on the screen, right? Um, and then maybe if you're lucky, some gravity forces kind of organized it into a way that is least objectionable. But the the process of just making a visualization doesn't make meaning and it doesn't make stories and things like that. It's when somebody comes along and curates that and says, okay, so now I've got a picture of 200 nodes. Let me filter out the ones that aren't meaningful. Let me highlight the connections that are meaningful. And here, Ms. Reader, is a story that I can tell out of this mishmash of big data. I've, I've curated it into stories. So my whole thing is, is stories are the way people think, the, the way that people knowledge. We use specialized tools to help us story, but we don't want to get distracted by the fact that the tools, the, the tools aren't the story, right? Um, the, the stories are still the story and the tools just help us serialize stories and deserialize stories. So that's my pitch. Mark, I think maybe you're up next, except you're muted. Mark, you're muted. Sorry. Um, yes, I am up next uh, by hand uh, signal, but I'd love to hear responses to what Peter just said. I, I asked a question um, in the chat um, about <clears throat> stories. Um, it's funny, I was in, in a conversation yesterday uh, with um, some uh, um, CTA um, uh, Collaborative Technology Alliance um, folks about um, ontologies and schemas and, um, and was thinking out of what they were saying about um, trying to strip down to um, people, you know, agents, those that can be profiled, um, th those that have agency, um, for lack of a better word, data information, nodes, um, a second category that is just stuff without agency, but but information that gathers um, metadata and stories, I would say as well, story elements as it, as it accumulates, I mean, things that stories can be told about. Um, and then containers, which is a much looser thing, which I wonder if it might include stories um, that when you, um, <clears throat> take all these random books in the library, um, some of which were they not constrained by physical space might fit in multiple sections or might fit in together in different ways according to different people, but you allow all these overlapping containers and stories to be created around them, which, um, you know, which of course they're harebrained stories, 
told about the same set, set of facts, but there's there's an inherent vetting and building of reputation in seeing the gravity of the connection between certain facts, um, data points, pieces of information that different agents have drawn in a story or by just tagging them the same way or by just connections that they have drawn. Um, <clears throat> and I don't know if those three elements, uh, <clears throat> I see Bill <clears throat> just asking the question, what is a fact before is a fact, you know, a, a data point, an assertion, which may be wrong, which, <clears throat> you know, and yes, incorrect data points can build some gravity um, and around a story that certain people are saying, telling each other. But if you also have as, as metadata around that item, other people saying this is wrong um, and other people with, with expertise in that area saying this is wrong, that can be telling for people. If you, if you go to that piece of data in a random access way, there's a little bit of a story that an individual piece of data tells that that has the information that different agents ha has the <clears throat> the containers um, i.e stories tags um, groupings that that different agents have put on it to say wow this this alleged fact is um, is associated with some things that other people say are wrong and the people who are expert in this field <clears throat> seem to say that this is wrong. It's, there's at least controversy here. Um, you know, the, the visualization of this can be done in many ways. Um, sorry, I, I, I'll, I'll stop, but I mean, I just wanted to throw out the idea of um that that random access quality being sort of a leveler because anybody can just come upon whether digitally or in the world um an item of information and if part of our job and part of our job in creating interoperability is to associate as much metadata and as many stories and containers that have been put there by other people um, to let somebody find something and let them use the all the spokes all the edges you know that come out of it to find people find related information dispute it um, find the stories that are built around it um, I think that's that's a little bit our job. <laughs> um, thanks, um, Michael, and uh, thanks, Peter. Um, these are both great um, notions. I am fairly known, um, or at least uh, unfairly known, <laughs> fairly unknown for uh, basically um trying to take the position that it's not all stories it's context it's different types of elements statements um oppositional propositions vague propositions um questions um and i find the story focus to be um, in the study of how we basically grow an understanding to be a limited kind of view. Um, I just, um, I, I'll try, I'll, 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 I'll just put that out there and, and come back to it later, but I certainly appreciate um, the slow culture vision of, or um story or example that peter told um i posted a uh, james maxwell quotation um and i'll just post the quotation um 
uh, in there, basically, um, and I'll read it out. Um, it's part of a uh, 1978, um, I'm, I'm looking for the Encyclopedia Britannica, where apparently this um, quote on entropy is, but let me read it out. A memorandum book does not, provided it is neatly written, appear confused to an illiterate person or to the owner who understands it thoroughly, but to any other person able to read it, it appears to be inextricably confused. So we've all had the experience of being in class and sharing notes with other people. And basically some people's notes are clear and understandable to us. Other people's notes are impenetrable. Um, and what I love about this quote is it's in the middle of available, a discussion of entropy, available energy and dissipated energy as heat. And um, this uh, notion of organization is linked to the states of motion um, of, of atoms. Um, but anyway, the, this little chunk um, really puts out a, a case to tie back to what Peter was talking about, about some kind of collaborative culture where we learn each other's signs and organizational systems and adapt mutually to each other so that we can have an artifact that is mutually meaningful. Now, whether that can be done on a website like Factor or even Wikipedia, um, uh, people are actually doing that. People are actually developing different ways of communicating. Um, when I was involved with um, Oh, the 3D um, Vermal, VRML. Um, it was a idea to create 3D spaces on the web. And like HTML, you could cut and paste and make your own stuff. But I went to architecture school and learned how to think in three dimensions. People can do the writing of HTML and the reading of HTML in a browser very easily to actually create visual, or at least I'll, I'll use the 3D example, to create spatial 3D spaces that make sense. Um, it was an authoring problem. You, you could not author a 3D space as easily as you could the 2D web page. And it, it kind of fizzled out and and died. So certainly what I'm trying to point out are the two aspects of creating the shared knowledge spaces, the writing part and the reading part. Um, they're not always as clear as we might ourselves imagine when it comes to involving other people. And um, certainly um, I loved what uh, Michael and, and, and Peter were talking about. Um, and unfortunately, I've got to go in about four minutes, but um, uh, thanks for listening. Thanks, Mark. Um, along with the, the Maxwell quote, thank you, Mark. Um, I wanted to share a Kafka letter, Franz Kafka letter. Um, it came up in the context of a smaller part of the, the quote of it, but it's a fun, um, it's a fun letter. It's in German, so you have to, you have to translate it. But um, uh, the the small quote was uh, um, words, or really a book. A book must be the ice ice axe for the frozen sea within us. But the, the whole letter is lovely. And I won't, I mean, grab it and uh, grab it and translate it.
that's not the, the that's the pull quote, but that's not the best part of it. Vincent. Hello, everyone. I have like a, a half baked thought. Um, whenever I find information or stories that are really interesting, um, my one of my first kind of urges is to like save it in a place where I know I can find it later. And I don't know if that's like a, almost like a bad learned habit because life is too demanding and we don't have the time when we come across something we like to actually like sit with it. It's like, you know, you come across like a, um, a patch of berries but there's like, a, you know, a wild tiger chasing you. And so you can like look at it, take a mental note of like where it is and then you have to keep running away. And so I don't know if that's um, and like a realistic uh, <laughs> uh, analogy um, because maybe we'll never be in a time where we can actually go through things. But yeah, I, I very rarely, um, there's this one tool I use called Refind when I open a new tab and it shows me like really interesting articles. And occasionally I'll like open up one of those articles and, and read it. But most of the times I'll save it for later. And then when I do have the time, I will open it up and read it. Um, but yeah, it, like for me, there's like almost two separate processes. There's the process of like being emergent, engaged in stories, which is like the actual juicy stuff. Like that's like the berries. It's what you live for. But then there's like a whole other process, which is like, all right, we're like hunting for <laughs> the stories or the berries. It's like, and that, that time is kind of unknown. You don't know when you're going to come across something. And so I feel like having an information system, which actually can help me take that unknown and make it a little bit more known. Like when I search for something on Google, I'm not sure if it's going to be on the first result of the page or it's gonna be on the like 107th page or I'm not gonna find it at all. Um, so having a way to like search and find information that's like reliable that when you do want to like sit down and, and engage with a story, you know, you could find it. Um, like last night I spent a half an hour looking on like, you know, four different websites for a movie to watch that was on Netflix and that um, wasn't over two hours because we didn't have that much time. Uh, and that was not super action packed because I actually got into a surfing incident. I was like super adrenaline, <laughs> adrenaline filled and I wanted something relaxing. Uh, ended up just watching Planet Earth because that was the only thing that uh, I knew was, <laughs> I knew was there uh, that met the criteria, but I couldn't actually find what I was looking for. And um, yeah, so that's kind of information management tools and wikis aren't just about the stories I think they're also about finding the stories and that process could be different um I'll jump in if nobody else is uh I would love to come back to that first thing you said Vincent about about running from the tiger and uh and you know not having time to deal with the berries um, I think the stories <clears throat> that we tell and the things, the, the information that each of these agents gathers in the random way that they do, like I'm running from a tiger, there's some berries. Mental note, I'm throwing that in the, the food folder. That that association of <clears throat> food and place were it like were it something that you could look at where somebody else who was running from a different tiger you know in a different direction you, you would never go back maybe to that that berry tree um because there are tigers around there <laughs> but uh um if that information were recorded if that metadata were recorded and layered on the metadata of other people doing different things some of whom weren't running from tigers and had time to stop and taste the berries and say these berries are really good 
and that were mapped in a way that said, hmm, there seem to be a lot of these berry trees that a couple of people have said were really good in this area. The north part of it has lots of tigers in it, but the south part of it, you know, this is the way that knowledge emerges and stories emerge from just one random bit of metadata that could be the metadata that is you putting it in a folder for later. You know what I'm saying? And, and that kind of layered, interactive, non-storytelling, just container placing, <laughs> um, seems, seems to me something, there's something there. So please, please keep, uh, maybe it's not yielding much yet, but please keep putting those things you see into a, a container or tagging them or, you know, I, mean, I think we all should, and then we have to figure out how we can all see it. Bye, Mark. Okay, I'll jump in. So I'm gonna go back to something I posted and then bring it back around to stories and everything everybody's talking about because I find this super interesting. So I think what I'm hearing and what everyone's saying is we're talking about capturing and storing knowledge it, in different phases, I guess I would call them phases where, and so what I posted before was sometimes we wanna just get to a resource, right? Either it's a piece of information we read, need right now, we don't really care about it at other times or just curious or a friend post, you know, pointed us to something but it's not really our thing or we just told we need to learn something for some reason or whatever, right? We just need, inf we just need information, it already exists. We need to get it from a book or a website or something. To me, that's a very different process than I'm exploring something that I really love. It's a new hobby or I'm more interested in it the more I explore it and I want to go deeper and I want to go broader and I want to, you know, I want to remember what I thought of three months ago when I was researching this, but then got sidetracked from researching this, that kind of knowledge storing and learning. And then we sometimes want to explore something that really no one knows yet or there's very little information about. And then, and that's a completely different thing. I completely agree with the thread of stories. I don't know that we always think about it, but I do think, you know, all the research and psychology even points to the fact that we're always creating a story in our mind. We have a story about how we feel about things. We have a story about who we are. We have a story about what what our origin is. We have a story about how we see the world that provides the filters and the perspectives that we have on the world. And whether we're consciously conscious of it, sorry, whether we're conscious of it or not, we are forming those stories all the time. And I, I don't know yet whether technology would benefit us in pointing out that process or simply just presenting us the pathways with which to, to, to get to where we need to go. But I think both are valuable. And I I guess what I'm trying to say is all of these things are important. All of them have value, whether we're just passing something by and we need to put it, you know, the, there we saw the berries and we were racing by. And so we think we need to store it um, for later when we're hungry and we're not being chased by a tiger. But what if somebody else had already stored that knowledge for us and we could trust that our society had that knowledge stored for us. So we didn't even have to waste the energy to store it, that we could go find it when we needed it. And we could trust that we could find it when we needed it, when, when it was important. And it might even then be surrounded with the best time to go is in the spring when the tigers have moved away and there's no one around, right? And you can take your time gathering. And in fact, and then here's how to process the berries so that the last of the winter, so that when the tigers are there, you don't have to, right? Like that, yes, that to me is the ideal, right? Is it's let's guess past the point where we're each curating for ourselves. There will always be that piece, but where we're also curating for each other simply because I already curated it for myself. Why not give it to you as well, right? It's common knowledge now. So to me, that's the juicy spots, right? Whether we wanna frame it in stories or not stories, to me, it's more valuable to frame it in what kind of phase I'm in. Am I in a phase of, I just need some information 
and I'm a, am I in a phase where I'm really deep diving into something and I want to use use the interface or the community or the interaction or whatever to really learn something deeply? Am I in a phase of creating something brand new? If I were to try to break it down into three, but I think there's it's a continuum really. Any thoughts? Off of um, what was being said in the chat here, um, what Vincent was saying of who do you curate for? Um, who do you wicked for? You others both. Um, that <clears throat> it's, re it's really interesting. One of the one of the uh, the use cases, the user stories. Um, that we imagined for factor in early days where when our orientation was more um, UN related NGO um, gathering um, gathering information so that you know people on the ground in one place were seeing the same things that you know somebody in New York was seeing um, and realizing that some of the data that needed to be gathered would be gathered by people who didn't know what its significance was. And that had to be surfaced. Like, you know, somebody in Sierra Leone takes a picture of somebody's arm and says, you know, what the hell is this, this disease that's, you know, forming on the, you know, not, not being a part of a UN team, not being anything, just just wanting to like say, hey, berries on this bush, you know, I don't know what it means, where it fits. I'm not sure this is for me or for you or for the greater world, but just, you know, data point. Um, and so, you know, that we don't really know why we're gathering, the, you know, not all of us are information gatherers, but we're kind of all information gatherers. And the easier it is for everybody to share their information, if it's not something they need to keep private, um, without knowing what its significance is, without knowing where it fits. I mean, the, 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 the metadata on the berry photograph or the skin photograph could just be a date and a location, and that's all there is. But somebody who is researching because they're doing a deep dive and looking for examples of berries in this region, you know, can find that. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, um, to, just to what, Wendy, what you were saying about, um, I don't have to gather this information because, um, because somebody else has already gathered it. I find the information that other people are have already gathered because I gather this in piece of information that I don't know I don't know where it fits, but I find out where it fits from from the other people. Um, you know, picture of it, at, at a more mature state, a picture of a berry in this place brings up all this information about you know, recipes for how to cook that berry, how to dry it for the winter, as you were saying, you know, watch out for the tigers, <laughs> all, all kinds of stuff. So yeah, um, I think we're, we're getting some good stuff here. <laughs> Shall I go? Okay, so I'm having a bit of a hard time with this conversation because I don't really know how to think about it, literally. So I, maybe I'll make some notes and send them out, but I, I'm a little confused about this word story, which has now become so big that it has, it's losing its meaning for me or the meaning I used to have. So I'm a little confused there, although I, 
I actually believe everything you're saying. I just I'm getting kind of unhinged here, so in a way that isn't helpful. And uh, so I don't really, I don't, I don't know. I have this is so it's quite generative. You know, this is a really rich conversation, but I think for me, at least, it's going to take a lot of work to come up with, to make sense of uh, just what we've talked about. And the idea of looking things up because, oh, I've seen this berry, what is it? In the neighborhood I live in, Texas, people just take pictures of snakes in their garden and post them on Facebook. You know, and either my wife or the snake wrangler comes back, oh, that's just a that's just a rat snake. You love those things. They eat, they eat, they eat things you don't want around in your yard. You know, so people don't expect to find it online. They expect some neighbor to go, oh, that thing. Just, you know, don't worry, it's not interested in you. Like the rattlesnake, which is like, you want to come, you want you want a piece of me? Come and take it. Right? Most snakes are like, oh, there's a big two-legged, I think I'll. I think I'll hide out. <laughs> so I'm just to say that I think this is super rich and I don't know how to make sense of it. I'm not sure I agree with all the assertions. So. The, the way to make sense of it is to keep talking and obviously not necessarily, we can do it asynchronously. But then the other, the other trick of that is to remember what we're talking about, um, which is gonna end up maybe in text. Yeah, and I, uh, well, yeah, well, I don't know, maybe later this week I'll find out when I know that I'm actually thinking rather than doing something else. So that would help if I could say, oh, now I'm thinking, <laughs> as opposed to what, Bill, uh, daydreaming, <laughs> you know. Um, it's inter super interesting. So thanks, thanks, thanks for it. Yeah, so as you were talking, Bill, I think I might have an example that might help <clears throat> because it's in the um, realm of education. So I always pictured a visual interface. Let's say you're a teacher the traditional model, and you can please feel free to correct me, would be I, as the teacher, know the body of knowledge that I need to cover in a semester. I'm going to start here, and I'm going to go through this path to get here. We're going to take some branches, if I think they're important tangents, to help people understand. Of course, I'll take questions and stuff, but I basically have my curriculum mapped out. I've got my exercises. I've got my group work. I've got my labs, I've got whatever, even maybe a field trip thrown in there to help integrate the knowledge, right? If I could take what I am visualizing and give it to a teacher, this is how I can imagine it working. I'm a teacher. I plan the couple days in advance with a visual representation of the knowledge I plan to teach in its smallest beginner form of just say a node and a couple of connections. On day one, we talk intro, we meet each other, all that normal stuff. And for homework, the kids assignment are to add one thing to the tree collaboratively, add one piece of information. The discussion is why did you add that piece of information and how does it relate to the topic that we're talking about in class? That could happen at a regular basis over the course of a semester, at the end of every semester, the tree of curated knowledge around the topic from which we've been learning looks different every single time, right? Because of what different students will add and why they added it. The why they added it is the story. I added this piece because I was, it made me think of blah, right? So history, but it made me one student think of how her family cooks and she ends up adding a recipe and a little story about how this particular recipe fits into history and where it came from, either from her family or 
or from the food or whatever. Whereas another kid goes off into politics and talks about, you know, wants to integrate what's happening now with what happened then, right? And and that becomes the story and that storyline, even if not only helps us learn, because that's how we think, even when we're not conscious of it, we think in associations. We learn much better when we connect a piece of information, as you probably well know, right, to something else we already know than if it's a piece of information that's just kind of floating out around there and doesn't seem to connect to anything. So it's helping literally build those connections in ways that are meaningful to the people in the room. Is that I don't know if that helps or not, but it's the way I think of it. Yeah, that's genius, actually. Um... And when I was teaching at the UT, it was a graduate level course on scientific data informatics. You know, I've shared that big list of uh, mind maps, but that's exactly how the course, the course started with a little scaffold diagram. Of... Now, I didn't have, I was in, you know, when we were trying to talk about what's this, the, you know, the information, what is it, what is it? Information properties of scientific data. I just would tell the class, I said, look, there's no textbook. We are here on our own. And I would say my goal for you is to have a worthwhile learning experience. You know any hitches? I can't do it for you. You're going to have to do it for you. I'm going to have a great one because I always do because I'm interested in that. But so that's the way I didn't really have the idea of if I were doing it now, I think I would have more technology to help people actually build an annotated kind of, I don't know, some monster. I would actually build a wiki of the results of, you know, these whatever, 15 weeks of interacting. But yes, I mean, I think that is, you know, yeah, well, well, so yes, I agree. I mean, I did that. <laughs> yeah, so does that clarify story to you? Because that was where you were. Yeah, that's a nice idea. I just, but I don't know. In this conversation, it got super big, like a pumpkin. <laughs> Which is something Lucy Sutchman at Xerox Park used to talk to the tech people about. Interoperability, she used to say, that's like a big idea. It's like it's like a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, my wife was there too. She used to push back on the tech people. They're like, what, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, and I think, again, it's, it's multi-layered, right? I have my individual story about myself. I have the story about this classroom. I have the story about the teacher. I have the story about what I'm learning that either provides it meaning or makes me think it's stupid, right? <laughs> And then, and to me, it's the, it's the scaling up version of that, you know, and Wendy Elford's version of that would be, we're, a, we're, we're a top, we're trying to look top down on a very complicated situation. And if we collect stories, we can make sense out of the threads that exist and see into what other people aren't seeing within them, you know, within their own within their own frame of experience, right? So it's still, be, it's sense making a larger story, which until computers came along, really the only way you could do that was sit around a fire and share and share stories, right? And see where the thread was. Now she's taught, she's able to find the thread. So instead of a thread of knowledge weaving through the semester of a classroom, going slightly in one direction or slightly in the other direction, depending on the students, you now have an entire community, a city, an organization or whatever, who are also going in one direction. And if management thinks they're going in this direction, but they're actually going in this direction, that's worthwhile knowing because otherwise we're solving the wrong problems or putting our energy in the wrong ways. Yeah, well, I just want to add one thing. I'm going to have to jump off in a, well, maybe another five minutes. But so the one thing that I came up for me, I didn't type it in the thing, is that when we start using story the way I've been hearing it, it almost thinks it sounds to me. Now we're going to reduce almost every experience they have to like you're telling a story. So once things get reduced, I'm like, I'm done now. Because that's an intellectual like model. And sorry, I'm a human organism. I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. Well, whatever. But um, so I think if it gets, if the word gets 
to be everything is a story, then after a while, we, we're not, you know what I mean? We're going to lose what it is we're talking about, which actually needs, depending on the task, certain distinctions to be made. Bill, I actually think you just got to something which was, I was about to say that the, if I'm hearing you right, <clears throat> the, the negative association um, that you have with stories is kind of their, you, you want them, well, I, I won't try and characterize what you're saying. I'll, I'll just say what I was gonna say, which is, that the people write stories about berries and tigers and legends and you know all kinds of mythology could be built around berries and tigers. We're, we're going to be talking about berries and tigers for a long time. Um, but the disam disambiguated information there that led them to tell the story um, is is what you want to get past, like. Not that stories are bad, but sometimes you don't want to hear somebody else's story. You want to filter out the stories, but just know that stories were told about this thing, that information was attached to it that you may want to associate in different ways. So, like, I want the benefit of the fact that this thing that somebody told a story about has these attributes that it's in this place, that it's, that this snake is in this yard, in this city, and that somebody else told a different story that happened to have another snake in this yard. And before you know it, hey, I realize that these snakes are, you know, indigenous to this area. And, you know, and the fact that, that somebody, you know, that, that, that this, this, question and answer that you have on Facebook, which is um, not the result of search, not the result of true storytelling, that we wanna preserve that disambiguated information and let that be a part of other people's research and other people's knowledge. Right now it's siloed only on Facebook, perhaps, you know, privately only on somebody's or, you know, some friend groups, um, uh, you know, page that, you know, a dozen people have access to, where they're not, they might be private about the banter, but they're not private about the fact that there's a snake in a photograph with this, you know, time and, and location metadata, if it was anonymized. Um, yeah, I just want to say one more thing before, because okay. you said something super critical. You used the word, um, you had a, either true storytelling or something. You called some, you had an adjective on storytelling that was <laughs> different. I don't have a negative association with the word story. I'm just responding to how it seems to be being used as we have this conversation. Oh, you see, yes, but something, so if there's something called, you know, true storytelling, then we better find out what that is before we start using the word story for all these, about many other things. I, I just think this is a longer, more interesting conversation. And I really do have to run and uh, squeeze the dog, as I like to say. He actually does the squeezing, but, you know. So I'm going to leave you all here and maybe I'll catch up on the, the video. Hey, and I can use the little, we can get the chat thing out of the video, can't we? We have yes. tools for that. <laughs> Adios, everybody. Have a good week. See you, Bill. More thoughts? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I really like what you had to say, Michael. Um, I put a couple things in the chat as you were talking, trying to capture a little bit of what you're saying and maybe add a little, 
a little um, extra too. Um, yeah, and I kind of agree with Bill. It's, it's, I'm not sure we need to continue to use the word story all the time, but it is an interesting exercise to think about it. And I do think there's a line between when we, when we seek out stories either from each other in person or whether it's, you know, through technical means um, in the traditional sense versus what our understanding might be of how we work unconsciously. And right, like when we get into that, I think um, there's a value there to just understanding that that thread runs through everything. But I think when we start talking about what features or what attributes or what characteristics do we want certain interactions and connections to have, I think story needs to be kind of put back in where and to more of the traditional sense. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm creating a workshop, there are times when I'm creating it and I have a very clear direction of where I want everyone to go and I know exactly how to get them there. And and I'm gonna walk them through that and get them where they need to go. There's less story there. But if I'm looking for for everyone to explore and we're all trying to figure out what's going on. Um, then I'm going to be looking for stories. I want to pull stories out. So I think, you know, I think, um, I think we, I just go back to using the word, <laughs> the traditional version is also fine, but it's also helped us today to explore the different ways in which humans interact with each other and potentially could interact with technology. And that's been really valuable. Uh, Zeke, you want to say something? I was just looking at the definition of story. <laughs> um, I think it's funny how there's so many definitions. That's why one of the qualms I have about the English language is it's just a little bit finicky. Um, and, uh, you know, I just think of story as like metadata. Um, I, I guess I've been so much in the back end of this stuff and thinking about it from a, a very technical perspective. So I just think of like information about information and I just think of like overlap, like holonic overlap for shared meaning context. Um, but this is very interesting to me. This is the kind of stuff that I've been exploring at great length for quite some time. Um, again, how it relates to the back end for these different technologies using distributed uh, web architecture and various frameworks for helping these different tools connect and interoperate. So that's like, this is the main thing I'm kind of diving into, I'd say right now. So this is cool that we're having this conversation. I'm grateful to be a part of this. Um, you know, one thing that did come to mind for me was so when I was learning about history and I got into different religions and um, you know archeology span and things like that, the word myth, we intuitively, a lot of us, or at least me and the people I grew up with, myth was like made up, it was false, or it was kind of elaborated or fabricated in some kind of context. But when you look at the original epitomology of it, it just means story. And so that's, what's, that's what kind of came to mind for all this is just the mythos. And um, I think that that is an inherently probably going to have meaning, different meaning to each individual, you know, what their individual mythos is along with their perspective and um, you know their community. So you know, this idea of perspectives is quite interesting to me because you know, having gone down the physics rabbit hole and stuff like that, it's like you, you know, you've said they've done different these like supposedly they've done these different stories, like they have the brain games and all that. And uh, you know, you can have 20 people see an event and you're getting 20 different accounts of that event. And a couple days go by and now all of a sudden the details have changed. So, I mean, that, that kind of is a little more on the, uh, you know, abstract theory side of things of like, what is reality? But, um, you know, I just wanted to share, like, those were the things that kind of like came to mind uh, when y'all were speaking. Thanks, Zeke. I love, I love that you just went to like mythos and, <laughs> and that perspective and physics. I mean, for me, that's, I've gone to all those places too. And it's fascinating how they kind of all land in the in, in similar spots, right? That 
we shape our perspective. Our perspective is shaped by our past and our habits and everything that's around us. And so the challenge I think for that I have tried to play with in creating something useful and imagining something useful made out of technology is how do we allow for all those possibilities in one interface, <laughs> which drives me crazy. And at the same time, that's why to me, the networked view of things works so well, because I can make it what I want it to be. And it can be that three layered or 3D layered, you know, multi-layered thing. So I can make the associations that make sense to me. Where it gets dicey is where, you know, sometimes this group is, I think it's been here, talked before about, okay, there's my version of things because this is my beliefs or these are, this is my background or this is my perspective on how I'd like to connect to this information. And then there's a big gray area. Like I'm like, okay, I've drawn a circle around myself. And then there's like this big, huge swath of gray area that is what I think is opposed to what you think, what I think is a variation on what you think, what I think has, you know, it comes at it from a different angle or whatever, right? And that's a huge gray area. Is how do we play together in that space in a way that makes sense and isn't so complicated that nobody wants to be there ever? And then there's this stuff on the outside of that. Yeah, we pretty much all agree that this is either fact or truth or information that everybody, the berries are still there a year later. Like it's still, you know, the berries and they're there and that's it, right? So, the gray area is the interesting part and the hardest part to me um, and how, and that's the collaborative part and allowing for each of us to navigate our way through that gray area in a way that make, provides meaning to me in my individual life or in the life of my family or my community is I think designing something that's flexible enough that doesn't have, that allows for those different perspectives I guess, and doesn't, you know, and here's where we start to get into the realm of like where biases are and where, and how do we visualize, how do we help people by visualizing those differences? In my mind, I started to do crowdsourcing things. I started to do, you know, going, hey, if there was a piece of information, we could all even, even here's the base in title of something and here are all the parts underneath. Could we all start to collaborate on yeah, most of us think that this is a great definition. And most of us think that this is a great resource. And most of us think this is the best book. And most of us write and, and yet still allow for the fringe things to be there. It's, it's, to me, that's where I'm playing right now is trying to, yeah. And I knew that I could, if I couldn't even get like baseline me, collective knowledge that we all kind of agree upon. If I can't even get that, then the gray area is like, you know, we're never then... <laughs> We can't even, we can't even start talking about the gray area. Zeke, go ahead. Don't wait for me because um, I've gotten plenty of airtime and you're just getting to speak up. <laughs> okay, thanks. I just wanted to address back to that real quick. Um, well, the, the dream that had come to me was actually, um, you can have multiple UIs but it's a shared backend, it's the shared distributed database um, and really customizable UIs. So like uh, it, it, where we're getting at is with these new types of technologies, you can, um, you, can, you can kind of like move the pieces around as it makes sense to you. Uh, initially, of course, until AI gets a little more advanced or at least integrated um, into this, uh, you know, it could be a template. So you could put the thing in the upper right-hand corner, the upper left, lower left, lower right, and those are your options, but you could still move it amongst those four pieces. So, because the way the different brains are wired, the way culturally, uh, there's a lot of different reasons that, you know, people are gonna interact with things differently, might even change according to mood. So some of the people I know are playing around with kind of like biofield sensing technology um, and those kinds of things. So that's kind of cool to think about how that might influence um, these different dynamics. So I, I envision really shared databases, shared backends, and but then it can be multiple different forms of presentation, but at least you've now bridged those silos between, you don't have to have 25 apps, you, you can have one app. It's almost like downloading an OS client, I guess, right? Yeah, and it's cool stuff um, to think about how this might, you know, uh, come about. Um, and, uh, and then the other really important thing that I think 
this in my opinion is um, this idea of being resistant to civil attacks, meaning multiple fake accounts. I think that's a huge problem right now of accountability is the fact that people can go and just say a bunch of stuff or act a certain way and they can do so kind of behind this like scene of anonymity. But as soon as you bring more of these things to light, people are now more, much more highly incentivized to be, be careful and scrutinize their behavior and the, the information that they share. So I think having um, ways in which you can have, you know, verifiably unique accounts, you know, you don't necessarily have to share all the information about the underlying account. You, you can, you don't necessarily know who they are. You don't have to know who they are. You can, if you want that in the rules of your network, but you at least know that they're verifiably unique, like that that account's actions has meaning. So if you could imagine, you know, your reputation or behavior, what do you want to call it in Uber affects the grocery store, affects the restaurant. And then now you could filter reviews that you want to read based on those scores. And, you know, it's more customizable. If you want to go and search um, for things, you can, you know, basically decide what's important to you, what metrics of measurement, you know, matter in the information that you want to access. I hope that's a good way to describe it. Yeah, and I want it. <laughs> and, and, you know, thinking about how, um, I mean, we, we, we talk about this in various groups of us, just that, that you know, wanting the shared, um, the shared library of, of um, data and all the different ways of looking at it whether it's in a wiki, in a map, in, you know, by association with people, by association with topics, by, you know, um, you, you know, just being able to filter um, in, in different front ends and within different front ends in different ways. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of interoperability I think, you know, we're, all striving for. Um, so you're going to build the back end for us. You got you got that you got that part knocked. I'm working on it right <laughs> now as we speak. <laughs> okay, let's talk. <laughs> um, I just also wanted to say something about the the um, myth making um, the myth. I'll go back to container um, for um, for certain sets of facts that you know individually, as when Wendy, as you were saying, you know, you come up with your own belief set, and and as groups we do, as religions we do, you know, the the sun you know rises in the east and sets in the west, and the myth that's built around that of the you know. Um, you know, pick your, you know, uh, Aboriginal, <laughs> you know, story of the wolf swallowing the sun and da da da, da you know, um, that we do that. And, you know, in modern day, we also do that in a way where like, oh, these, these facts don't fit with the mythology I already you know, constructed, and therefore I'm not going to include them. Um, but if if everybody has access to all the, I, I'm, you know, I have the problem of do you call them facts? Even all the all the 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 possible data points within somebody's story are and the metadata attached to them is all accessible to anybody who is looking at their own story, constructing a story, knowing what pieces of a story, um, you know, are questionable. I mean, if, if you wanna lead anybody, you know, we all always have this problem of like, can you really, can you really change somebody's mind by attacking their story? Um, you know, they're going to want to defend their story. But if anybody on their own can see 
what parts of their story have different stories attached to them that don't don't negate the fact that this piece of their story exists, but provide other related explanations that might be able to bend their thinking a little bit, or at least open themselves up to mm, maybe this thing can be seen a different way. You know, maybe there's a scientific explanation for the sun coming up in the east and setting in the west. I mean, it's it it's. Yeah, I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> but I just like, you know, the, the story as container I, I come back to and the and like let's let um data points that don't have stories around them exist. I, I guess I guess part of what I'm what I'm trying to say is like trying to think of a framework in which it's okay to for a fact to be. A data point to be part of a story it's okay for it not to be part of a story it's okay for it to be part of multiple stories and we all get visibility on all of that um if if we want it and we can also filter out like you know i'm just interested in recipes for these berries i don't care about the the mist and the tigers and the location where they came i don't i don't want any of that please just show me recipes and you don't see all that stuff Yeah, I think you said it all. I can't even remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> um, yeah, I think one of the things I was I was going to say somewhere in there is, you know, there's the myth of the hero's journey, right? And and with which is Joseph Campbell. Nod your head if you know of Joseph Campbell and all this. Okay, so everybody's familiar. Okay, so when you start looking at how often the humans retell that story, and it's million, literally millions of versions of this story, you know, and here Joseph Campbell tried to break it down and put it into parts and give us, give us a schema from which to follow along if we want to build this story or understand it better. And that's really, really useful. And then to Michael's point, yeah, but sometimes I just need some berries. And do we need to go through a whole <laughs> hero's journey to find the berries? No, right? So again, I think there's, there's an opportunity if we're, if we're in trauma, we need to tell stories. If we're in therapy, we need space held for stories. And how do we come? Oh yeah, this is the other thing. So when you have two people who, who conflict on their version of truth, and it seems diametrically opposed, pretty much everybody agrees that the way to get through that is to find connection, right? So what if we had a platform that helped us to build connection, right? So it's the same database, it's the same data. It, it's, we are now, but the visual then shows these two things are currently opposed. And now here's a little intersection and people start working on, well, where's the intersection between those two things right here, right here in between the in-between space, right? And so even if these two sections seemingly get more and more diametrically opposed, it turns out that everyone likes puppies, right? Or <laughs> whatever, you know, it's, it's, and I think that that's where um, Massive Wiki is helping, right? Like anytime we're building connections, it's a very human thing that brings us, that's how we're wired, right? It brings us, we don't always need a story or we need, we don't always need to know that we're building a story, even if we are, we need to build connections. To me, that's the key. Stories do that really, really well because they elicit emotion and emotion elicits connection. But I mean, the connection be built in, a, in, in myriads of ways and, um, and it breaks down barriers. It breaks down silos between people, between information, between it's about, so to me, it's about the connections in the end. Yeah, and then, and then back to what you were saying, Zeke, one database helps to build connections faster by its very nature in my, my estimation, right? Because you're not, now we're not all slowed down. The whole system doesn't slow down to go, okay, but this, connect, this system doesn't talk to that system. Okay, well, two years of development and, and a million headaches later, now we can finally send two pieces of information across to each other, right? It's not, the point is, right, to, to facilitate all of that um, yes. How, how do we do that? 
<laughs> we needed that yesterday. <laughs> I'm sure that every single developer in the entire history of the internet has been saying, how do we, you know, how do we get these two pieces of information on the same database? <laughs> are, you, are you familiar with uh, self-hosting, cloud hosting? Yeah. So, just, just from a user perspective, not from a tech, technical perspective. Right now, our information, you send a text to your family and friend. And that's now seen in 10,000 databases across the world. Um, so those are centralized servers, giant big warehouse buildings with just stacks and stacks of servers and an IT team and all that stuff. So taking that and giving a slice to the individual, allowing them to plug in a device that uses the same amount of electricity as your hard drive would on like full capacity or whatever. So much less than mining uh, crypto or anything like that. But then um, you're sharing different instances of these applications across a large range of nodes. Um, and now you have a distributed database. I believe that that's one possible solution um, potentially where, you know, um, there's, there's like always going to be a fractally divided, I want to say silos, but they don't necessarily have to function so much like silos. It's more, I think of them as like permissioned membranes, permission servers, right? Um, but still, like, it's so cool because the, the way that they can access the data, it doesn't require global consensus, but you can still find, you can still very readily identify where, where there's that overlap, kind of how you were talking about. There's the core and then there's the periphery gray area, but it, it should, in theory, I would think, allow us to identify where we have the most overlap in our, in our data, in our shared data, right? I'm, I'm really, uh, um, I really like permissioning, um, decentralization and permissioning, you know, coming up out of that. I'm not sure I followed everything that you were saying, but the idea that, um, <clears throat> well, the, the, the holy grail that um, we, all have all of our own information on our own hard drives and the ability to permission it outwards in myriad ways um, saying like, I want this specific inf piece of information to be shared with this one person to I want this data I've ga gathered about you know, berries in this location to be shared globally, but without specific attribution to me, except as somebody who was a first degree witness to the berries existing in that place, as a, as a for instance, that just, um, you know, that, that, that control of permissioning um, and permissioning as container. <laughs> yeah, it's what um, the uh, internet was supposed to be. She mentioned Tim yeah. Berners-Lee and his original dream, what his original vision of the internet was supposed to be. Um, so we, we can self-host our applications. So, you know, we are, we, are hosting, we are hosting our own data. It's not going through, it's no longer going through that centralized uh, database. Um, so that allows for, um, I mean, there's tons of challenges, of course, obstacles that come with that, especially for security. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it should be much quicker. In theory, things could be a lot more lightweight. You wouldn't need as many lines of codes. You wouldn't need as many calls and things like that. Um, so, and it also should open up the door for um, just the ability to see the different perspectives. So you can kind of like, you know, get a better idea of more of a compilation of what this server over here is seeing or doing and so on. So you get a variety of the different perspectives as to what's going on. And then ultimately, you know, once, once artificial super intelligence arrives sometime, whenever that is, um, now you're talking about literally like a cloud, you know, like the robot Sophia's brain, like it's just the cloud is like in her brain, whatever it is, you know, 
um, that part is scary, maybe. But um, just if you look at the idea of an intentional intelligence, programmable intelligence, it's the ability of what it can allow us to do with a lot of automated processing and handling of data. So one of the things that the reason I'm sharing is one of the things I'm very interested in is this idea of oracles. So oracles is like a, a box, like a black box, you put an input and then it gives you an output. So it's like an, basically an automated function. And so I could see these different functions being able to kind of gather data. So it's not like a human necessarily that has to like enter in this data in this database and organize it, but it's, it's more of a conglomeration. I'm sure like big tech companies are already using that now. I mean, governments for sure have to be using it, but allowing those same technologies that they have that's, you know, um, proprietary and giving that to the people, I think could really open up the floodgates for like, for what we're talking about. Um, I don't know how that's possible, but that's just like, what that's what I'm hoping can happen at some point. Yes, yeah, so going back to the privacy piece for a second, when I started to envision, okay, this is my store of knowledge and I started to talk to people about privacy issues around that, it both frightened people, but also open doors too, right? Like if there, if we really could trust that the thing I'm creating for my curating knowledge for myself, it can be private because I'm storing it here. It's next to me. I only give permission to people who I give permission to access it then a whole host of things becomes possible, right? Now I'm not just storing knowledge like the berries, right? I'm storing knowledge that is, that I am extremely aware I want to keep private. I'm working on something brand new. Someone, someone could take it and run with it and I'm not ready to publish it yet. Could be one, which is knowledge. Uh, based, but what about medical based? What about financial based? What about right, all those other ways in which right now a lot of my data is sitting somewhere else which, you know, it has to sit with like a high wall around it and I, I barely can get access to it. What if I owned that? And it could start making associations between the things that I already know about my own financial or medical situation and that other, the, the other space out there, right? Where it's just the shared knowledge space. And I can dip in and out of those two and go, oh, wow, this is a diagnosis that I just received, or these are symptoms I have, or this is my past history. And what's, you know, what can I learn from the, from the, the, the knowledge network, from the public knowledge network sphere about myself. And, Ooh, that's interesting. Save it down. Ooh, that's interesting. Save it down. Ooh, that's interesting. Save it down. You know what? And these five things over here are kind of interesting too, but let me save them for later. And let me curate it in a way that I can find it when I want it. Right. So to me, it's opens the door to us as humans reowning our own story, you might say, or our own knowledge and being able to use technology for that benefit of knowing ourselves better in a world that in, in our lifetimes, we come across, I don't know what the factor is of the amount of information we now come across and have access to in comparison to just say two generations ago. And we, but our brains can't hold it much more than we use, right? So let's use technology to hold it and help us help facilitate that thinking, really take advantage of all that's available to us is super cool. And I don't think it's really possible unless we can lock it. Thus, we as individuals can trust that it's locked in a safe place. I'll always be a little nervous, right? And I always won't want to put up the most important pieces of my life on this thing unless I know it's really safe. And so this is, to me, this is huge. It's foundation, it's part of the reason why I'm struggling. I struggled for years to develop it because I was like, ah, I kind of want to wait for that technology to come up because I don't want to develop it twice. I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying and resonating and, and, um, and also um, thinking about the, you know, we want to feel secure, and yet our our you know identities can be um, stolen, and our our you know our finances, our financial records can be hacked, and 
you know, people probably don't want to get at our medical records, but certainly, you know, when they're in somebody else's hands, we're worried about that. And um, <clears throat> that security piece is, you know, what's under our control, we can govern, but there's so much that's not under our control. Um, yeah, and, and, and just uh, to circle back to something you were saying, Zeke, actually, I don't remember who was saying this, but just about the, yeah, I think it was you, Zeke, talking about, um, you know, oracles and, and um, you know, gen general intelligence when it comes to be um, like being able to, just the way that we construct mythologies and stories and, and explanations and scientific theories around um, facts to be able to loose um, a general intelligence, an oracle, you know, something on a set of facts that we don't even know what we want to make of. Um, but just to like say, you know, maybe not be smart enough to have a point of view, um, but more say, here's a possible explanation that fits all these facts together. Um, or th these data points, which may or may not be facts. Um, and, and, you know, this one makes sense of like 90 of the 100 facts you put in here, but these 10 would disprove it. So maybe it's worth concentrating on whether these 10 are in fact, you know, accurate. Because um, if they're not, then, then this all works. But if you know those to be true, then this whole thing falls apart. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, general access to all of those data points um, in the same language, you know, including the snake photos in the garden on Facebook, <laughs> want to get there. And the cool thing with the Internet of Things, we're going to have access to large amounts of data like never before. So that hopefully will help this process because we'll just have access to they're going to have all these little sensors on everything. You're just going to be uploading tons and tons of data constantly all the time about a bunch of stuff. That's going to be really cool. And then just having it so that we can compile that data and design algorithms in which the machine can you know, start learning about it and trying to piece it together. And then it presents us, says, hey, you know, we've got all this, like, these are the 90, these are the 10, and here's like some stuff and what it could mean. And these are other people that are, you know, doing the same thing and reading and learning about this. And so it just can present to you. And then you can say, like, you can even, you know, teach it. It's like machine learning, human, human guided machine learning makes a lot of sense. So yeah, that was helpful. No, that wasn't helpful. Or let's put that aside for later. And then if, and, you know, tag it, if something else comes up, let me know, pop up a notification, stuff like that. Um, so it's really cool to think about the fact that like right now we don't have yet all these sensors and all this like data get um, access to potential data. But once that's available, then that, that I think can open up a lot of, a lot of possibilities too. And that brings me to the fears that we all have and that, you know, are, are realized and true about um, the monitoring of the data that we generate by third parties, by, you know, the Amazons and the Googles and the, you know, the, the ad targeting um, algorithms that we feel uncomfortable about and we want control over. Um, and when you think about, you know, IoT stuff, you think, oh my God, is you know my vacuum cleaner going to be eavesdropping on my conversation so Amazon can like you know change the pricing on something because they know I really want it. Um, and if if we felt confident that we all individually had you know control of that stuff on our own servers and shared it voluntarily, like I'm fine with sharing you know, the chemical analysis of the dust in my house um, via my vacuum cleaner with, you know, academic institutions that are, you know, looking at the migratory habits of different animals and can tell from, you know, there, there's all kinds of stuff that you'd be cool with if you knew, yeah, all right, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm 
up for that. I'm down for that. Here's my data. You can you can have a constant monitoring of the flow of data from my vacuum cleaner, you know, this research program. It would be a lot different than, God, don't let anybody see anything because I don't know what they're doing with it. That's right. Yeah. And it'd be really cool to know what people are doing with it to see how useful it's been. It encourages you to write to then give more data to the right people too is key. So yeah, that's cool. I agree. If people are willing, I just want to flip this on its head for a second, because we're talking about the edges of where this could go, which is super cool. And then it's reminding me of an article I read yesterday, which is the simple, the simplest version of this and how it could be immensely useful right now, which is I was reading this article and I've been thinking a lot about phantom work. We were talking about this last week, right, Michael? Can't remember. Okay. So I read a really good article about um, written by, it was in the Atlantic. I can post it if you guys want to, um, want to read it um, uh, from a woman who writes often about um, the social, um, the government's projects and, um, and solutions for supporting the social structure of society, right? So it could be like helping somebody with homelessness or helping somebody get money from the government who they were promised because of COVID-19 issues or whatever, right? Any, any of those kind of programs. And she's saying she got to a point where she, you know, obviously there's always red tape, obviously there's always um, too many forms to fill out all the rest. But she's got to a point where she started noticing after reporting on it for years and years, maybe this was about, I'm, I'm guessing now about five years ago or something, she started to recognize that, wow, this has gotten to a whole new level of complicated. And does it really need to be this complicated? Like there's such uh, uh, so much friction for people who are need help to get the help that they need, whether it's in healthcare and making a million phone calls to your insurance company when you're ill, or it's, you know, not, you know, homelessness and making, having to fill out forms with random questions that make absolutely no sense to anybody under any circumstances in order to just have a meeting with somebody. And she pointed out some very clear examples of how this works. And so I just think it's interesting. I think that it, you know, just having a knowledge repository, we're not even talking about personal now, we're not even talking about the gray area, and we're not even talking about the future of what's possible. We're talking about that public knowledge store that could be um, that with the time and attention of people who have the time and attention to give could be immensely useful to the people who don't have the time and attention to give, who are either you know, are ill or don't have the money, the resources, the time, the energy, the whatever. And she talked about how those things used to be done by a government agency. There's really no quality control at that anymore. So now teachers are doing that work and social workers are doing that work and other, you know, nonprofit agencies are doing the work of trying to help individuals get to what they need and get through the system to what they need. So it's just interesting to me, um, as a, as a thought exercise and maybe also as a good ca test case too, in terms of trying to get information to the right people at the right time and the right place when they need it. Um, it's low hanging fruit in terms of solutions, you know, solution finding, you know, here's the solution, here's how to get through it. Here's an organization that'll help you navigate through it. You know, at least you have the information at the, at the baseline, um, just as a thought. Thanks, Peter. That's the one. Was it you that posted it to Mattermost? So did someone post it to Mattermost? Is that how I ended up with it? Because I can't even remember. Um, I, I didn't start with it. So, um, I, I grabbed the link. I, I found the link after somebody had mentioned it. I think maybe it was you. And, and Michael knows it too, obviously. So we're coming up on two hours. This has been an awesome conversation. Maybe it's a good time to wrap. <laughs> um, I'll I'm post- glad uh, we recorded the, this one. Me um, too, I'm yeah. Looking forward to- Thank goodness. <laughs> um, I'll post the, uh, the Zoom chat uh, in the channel uh, and I'll post a link to the recording there and, and I'll get it on YouTube uh, publicly. It's so nice to meet you, Zeke. I'm so glad you were here today. And nice to meet you. 
Yeah. And, uh, I really appreciate this conversation. This was amazing. Thank you all for doing what you're doing and being you. It was great. Yeah, you, you thank too. You. I, I think you. Um, we'd all agree. And I think I probably speak for everyone and that if you're interested in working with us on, on trying to figure this out, we are very much welcoming of your time and talents. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Totally. And love to know what you're doing and, and, you know, how we can support you. Cool. So. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'm very excited to um, get connected. So just let me know. Cool. Zeke, you know about Manimust and yeah, you do. Yeah, I'm not, I haven't been using it, but I'm familiar. I can hop on there. This, um, I just, this is I, the I'm the one that I'll hop on anything. Whatever app people are using, I'll jump in there. Just, uh, I don't have experience with any of these things. I haven't used social media in like a decade, literally. So um, there's a lot of things I'm just not going to know about, like current events and stuff. So keep that in mind. Also, <laughs> too, like I just may struggle to like figure out how to use some of these things, but I'm very curious to hear people's opinions on what they like and don't like about certain uh, software and applications because I didn't realize I'd end up being in this where I am now designing it, but I am. So I need to kind of know now, like what's what's out there. So there's yeah. a uh, so the Mattermost is um, where this community uh, kind of hangs out when we're not on calls um, in the Flotilla channel. Um, there's a, another channel you might be interested in, which is uh, Synergic uh, Social Media, um, which is kind of somebody who's working on a uh less unvirtuous uh social media um but it's it's also kind of a general you you might have some good conversations there about what's good and bad about different different uh, social media um, platforms great yeah yeah that'd be great just um yeah and info, dm me the info and i'll uh, hop in there and feel free again as michael was saying to post whatever questions you have too i found I'm pretty new to, to this experience as well with everyone else in collaboration. So I found, I can just speak to my own experience in saying, I found that if you post a question, there's plenty of people who will be willing to, to chime in in a very supportive way to, um, to either, you know, bring your attention to resources you didn't know, or, you know, answer the question directly or whatever. So however we can support you is what I'm getting at. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. This is, uh, this is the, bigger than us, you know, it's really cool. It's great. It's really great to meet people like yourselves. <laughs> you too. My husband came down, I had you guys on, on mute and I'm making my lunch and he's, he just leans in. He goes, oh, I can't even like, <laughs> you didn't say that, but I just know <laughs> not everyone likes to have these conversations and I would try to have them with him. And he'd be like, please, I have a headache. Like I just, <laughs> He runs, he runs software in his day job too. He's, he's the VP of Pimsleur, which is a language learning, you know, he's developed their app and, you know, so he's like, I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, and, um, and I'm like, please, I really want this stuff is great. <laughs> it's just nice to have it, have a forum, talk about it with other people who are interested and we all see the potential because it's heavy topics. We start talking about, we get into, and, um, you know, I know at times it can really weigh me down and give me compassion fatigue. So um, it's nice to have be in a, an environment with people who feel like there is a path through. So thank you, thank you for always holding this space, and it's been great. Thanks all. Have a great weekend. Y'all have a great day. Great weekend. See you. Bye.